You know, we meet now at the most disruptive and most critical moment in microelectronics in our lifetimes, in our lifetimes. And I'd like to share with you over the next few minutes why I think this is true and what DARPA is doing to help lead us through this period of disruption. So ladies and gentlemen, let me begin by welcoming you to the Day of Reckoning. Well, if you're listening to Pat Gelsinger, you know you've heard that term before, and you may not know exactly what it means. Uh, so if you don't, let me tell you a story. And that story begins 63 years ago, uh, and the date was September 27, 1960. Because it was on that date that Fairchild Semiconductor announced the very first monolithic integrated circuit. So we usually tend to think that the key enabler for the microelectronics age was the invention of the transistor, which happened in 1947. But I would argue that the invention of the monolithic integrated circuit in 1960 was the more important development. All we know as microelectronics came from that silicon monolithic integrated circuit. And without that monolithic process, transistors might be just novelties. What does monolithic integration really mean? It means a process, one that combines miniaturized transistors and other electronic components and interconnects all onto a flat piece of a semiconductor like silicon. In other words, it means a chip. Just think about that word, chip. Nowadays, we use the word chip synonymously to mean electronics. That's why we called it the CHIPS Act, as we just heard about. Chips, microelectronics, they're the same thing, right? Well, maybe. We'll come back to that. But in 1960, the chip was the disruptive idea. And it depended on inventing a monolithic process. So that Fairchild team began by reinventing the transistor. It made one that was two-dimensional. In other words, one that could be manufactured on the surface of a semiconductor. The Fairchild team also leveraged pioneering work of Jack Kilby from Texas Instruments, whose idea had been to get rid of the wires. That is, he invented a, a planar process for interconnections between transistors. And he called this, his, uh, this concept his flying wires concept. So by adding planar transistors to Kilby's flying wires, the chip was born. OK. I've talked a lot already about monolithic. But why is monolithic so important? It's because that monolithic 2D chip can be mass man manufactured in large volumes using wafers. And the takeaway, therefore, is this. The key technology that ushered in the microelectronics age was not a device technology, not a technology like the transistor. Instead, it was a manufacturing technology. OK. Now, DARPA barely existed in 1960. But we played a major role in another big microelectronics manufacturing story. In the late 1980s, the advanced transistor technology for radio frequency applications, uh, radar, for example, used a material called gallium arsenide. But the application of gallium arsenide electronics was once more limited by manufacturing. In that day, gallium arsenide circuits were built using wire bonds and microwave circuit boards, or they were even mounted in waveguide structures. So all of this made gallium arsenide electronics really expensive. But even worse, it caused problems. Those wire bonds were hard to control, and that led to performance variations, and that led to reliability problems. So in its microwave and millimeter wave monolithic integrated circuit program, the MIMIC program, DARPA created the technology to make the world's first RF integrated circuits. The DARPA MIMIC program directly enabled the active electronically scanned array, the AESA, which is still the dominant technology for military and RF communications and sensing. And by the way, this program gave us the world, gave the world the key technology to allow this, the portable cell phone, which to this day relies on MIMICs. OK, so we've just seen a couple of ex examples of how manufacturing technologies can change the world. As it happens, both involve monolithic integration. In other words, cramming more components onto integrated circuits. 
cramming more components onto integrated circuits. <laughs> that was the title of a famous article in which Gordon Moore introduced what is widely known as Moore's Law. Moore's Law was about integration. It was not about devices like transistors. And Moore's key observation was that the number of components that could be integrated onto a chip had been increasing exponentially with time. And so it has been over an amazing 60-year stretch. We've continued to cram more and more components onto integrated circuits. For example, here is a circuit from one of our programs that has about six trillion transistors, probably a record. And if you're interested in this circuit and learning more about it, by the way, come to the poster session and we'll tell you more about this result. So for 60 years, it seemed like the number of components we can cram onto an integrated circuit has been endless. But not so. The game is now over, which finally brings me to why we have reached the day of reckoning. So the day of reckoning was, of course, not my words. That's exactly what Gordon Moore called it in that same paper some 60 years ago. And what he meant by that term is just what I mean now. We are finally at the end of the age of the monolithic integrated circuit. Now, why after 60 years would I think that that is true? There's actually two good reasons, and either one of them is sufficient. The first one is about transistor size. The number of transistors that you can monolithically integrate into a given area depends on the area of the transistor. Now, we usually, when we think about the dimensions of a transistor, think about its length. Because it's the gate length, of the, which is the parameter that, that matters most for performance. Gate lengths are small, very small, but they still have not hit their ultimate limits. The key thing is this, though. The area of the transistor has stopped getting smaller. So cramming more components on integrated circuits is no longer physically possible. That is, not unless you manufacture in a way that's different. And by different, what I really mean is not monolithically. So the second reason that we've reached the day of reckoning is probably even more inevitable. And it's exactly what Moore had in mind in his paper. This reason is not about physics. It's about economics. So I want you to read what Moore said in his paper 60 years ago. So he's pointing out that there becomes a point at which designing and fabricating a single, highly complex, monolithic chip is more expensive and less effective than assembling a chip from smaller units, what today we would call from chiplets. So take a look at this chart, which shows the exponential growth in the cost of a state-of-the-art semiconductor fabrication facility, those wonderful places where monolithic chips are made. Or this one that shows a similar trend in the cost just to design a complex monolithic circuit. These are trends that, are, that make leading edge electronics unaffordable for just about everyone, especially those of us involved in government electronics. So welcome, everyone, to the beginning of the end of the monolithic chip. Welcome to the day of reckoning. DARPA is about anticipating and creating technical surprise. And so it may not surprise you that when we recognize that a day of reckoning is coming, we roll up our sleeves. Which brings me to ERI 2.0 and what we at DARPA are doing in this moment of disruption. DARPA established ERI, the Electronics Resurgence Initiative, in 2017 in recognition of the importance of microelectronics to both national security and to the US economy. In doing so, we recognize a convergence in the great challenges like supply chain vulnerabilities and hardware security, both for defense and commercial electronics. ERI is a statement that we recognize how imperative it is for us to work together to solve these problems. Now we have begun ERI 2.0, and ERI 2.0 seeks nothing less than to reinvent the integrated circuit, moving from the monolithic to the assembled era. 
Over the next couple days, you'll be hearing about our strategy at DARPA for achieving this. In our next session, after the break, we'll discuss DARPA's plans to create the 3D microsystems of tomorrow. This includes NGMM, Next Generation Microsystems Manufacturer, which is DARPA's big initiative in making such assembled 3D microsystems broadly accessible. We imagine layers of electronics with super dense interconnects that provide paths for information to travel just as easily vertically as they do today horizontally. Not only will this allow us to overcome today's data bottlenecks, but it will allow the incorporation into our micromachines superior materials, improved devices, and enabling new functions. DARPA is creating new technologies to support assembly of complex structures. We are looking at ways to incorporate photonics and non-silicon electronics into these systems, and we are developing new ways to power and to cool these compound structures. But manufacturing is more than just fabrication. Design and test of complex microsystems is already incredibly complex and expensive. Revolutionizing manufacture can only succeed if we can invent new methods to design our complex 3D circuits, and if we can invent new ways to test what we've assembled. DARPA is sponsoring research to compose complex 2D and 3D microsystems and to test them once they have been fabricated quickly and with assurance. And speaking of assurance, keeping electronics secure from the design stage to manufacture to sustainment is already incredibly difficult. And it's a challenge that we have taken on at DARPA in a big way. There may be no better example of how today the needs of the commercial electronics world and the warfighter have converged than hardware security. And if we aren't careful, moving to 3D microelectronics could open the door to even more dangerous vulnerabilities for all of us. But it could also offer mitigation paths and new opportunities. DARPA is advancing technologies to ensure that the microsystems we manufacture do exactly what we want them to do and only what we want them to do. Our nation's warfighters depend on microelectronics across the world's most diverse and extreme environments and even beyond. We are developing manufacturing processes that can be tailored for such environments. Electronics that can operate at high temperatures, like the kind needed for jet turbines, and at high radiation environments, like for space, will lead to critical tactical advantages for the warfighter. Another way we expect 3D microelectronics to excel is by enabling new and better ways of computation. DARPA is exploring unconventional computational paradigms like neuromorphic, analog, and low temperature digital to achieve breakthrough in computational efficiency. That is, the number of computations that can be done with a watt of energy. This can be incredibly important for edge applications where power is often quite limited. DARPA is investing in these new computational ap approaches like compute and memory that will mitigate the energy costs of moving data on chip. We are also developing specialty compute platforms that accelerate computation for specific functions and in high performance reconfigurable computational architectures. Similarly, our computational approaches and 3D architectures that we are creating will create the next breakthrough in artificial intelligence. At DARPA, our focus is on decision-making that occurs for operations at the edge. These decisions must be made very quickly and autonomously and often at very low power. So we are looking at new approaches to achieve AI computational engines that have much greater efficiency. And finally, our new manufacturing technologies will enable communications that are secure and always available, both for the warfighter war and in the commercial domain. Today, information and communication technologies are converging. Communications has depended on electronics for generations, but increasingly, electronics depends just as much on communications. A great example is cloud computing. 
Your cell phone uses data from servers without your even recognizing it. In the same way, military electronic systems are increasingly interconnected. So maintaining secure and always available communications is essential. Today is the day of reckoning, but not to fear. It's not as ominous as it might sound. In fact, DARPA sees huge opportunities. <laughs> We're working to create new microelectronics technologies for manufacturing. We're hoping to lead to performance breakthroughs and superior capabilities for both US industry and the warfighter. And we are looking forward to working with you to make that all happen. So sit back, get ready, and we'll share with you what we've been up to in ERI 2.0. And we get to listen to your great ideas. Let's go reinvent microelectronics manufacturing together. It's going to be fun. Thank you very much. <laughs>